Follow me. Two words every soul in creation is confronted with. A command, a verdict with eternity as its gift. Follow me, Jesus says, and deny yourself. Pick up your cross, baptize, and make disciples of all nations. This world will persecute you. But seek him, proclaim him, acknowledge him before men here on earth. Be reconciled, innocent, raised again to a new life. Follow me, he says, and you will know the Father. This is what it looks like to truly follow Jesus. How y'all doing? Doing all right? If you have a Bible, turn with me to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 here in just a second. My name is John Aiken. I oversee the FC School of Ministry and I'm excited to be with you this morning as we continue this series on life on the mountain. Uh, one of the things that uh, comes up every generation, almost every year it seems, that becomes really popular if you, you look at the charts, are songs about payback. I don't know if you've ever looked at this or, or thought about this, like revenge songs, payback songs are always really popular. Like, let's, let's talk about Carrie Underwood for a second. Like, almost every, I don't know what's wrong with the girl, but almost every other song she has her boyfriend cheated on her, her husband cheated on her, her husband beat her, or her dad beat her, and so she had to kill him and hide the body, like, or beat up the car, or whatever it is. It's like, next, I think next year, her dog's going to run away from her, and she's going to sing about that. Uh, but like every song, right, almost every song that she's come out with, it's, she's, she's hiding the, this abusive relationship with her husband, so she's, she's praying on the back row with the Baptist, right? Or she's taking a Louisville slugger to her boyfriend's car, because she's been cheated on, or she's been abused. There was a song that came out last year that became very popular uh, called Sorry Not Sorry. It was about a girl who got dumped and now she's got her revenge on this, this boy that dumped her. And so she said, I'm out here looking like revenge and you're out here looking like regret. And you're not going to get a second chance with me. Or what about Toby Keith? You guys like uh, Toby Keith's How Do You Like Me Now, right? You got this girl that he liked in high school. She made fun of him. And so now he's like, hey, guess what? I'm living in your radio right? I'm the alarm that wakes you up in the morning. You've got this rich husband. He's never around. Your life's miserable, but I'm this big star, and now you can't even turn me off because I'm, I'm living in your radio. Or Imagine Dragons had a song last year called Thunder, in which they talk about how uh, when they were in school, when they were in high school, they wanted to be stars, and they were, had all these plans about how they were going to become stars, and the kids in their classrooms made fun of them and, and, and joked on them and said they were basic. They were never going to make it, and they said, now we're singing on stages and you're, you're clapping up in the nosebleeds. We've made it and we've got our revenge. People love those songs. People love movies like, uh, it's an older movie now, which kind of shows my age. And so if you're my age or older, or maybe you read the book um, in high school, but The Count of Monte Cristo, right? Have you ever seen that movie? The guy was, was wrongfully accused, put in prison and in solitary confinement for over 15 years for a crime he didn't commit. When he finally escapes, he coldly gets his revenge on everybody who lied about him and who did him wrong. And I don't know about you, but I love it. Like every time it is awesome when you see that happen. Why are those stories so popular? Why are those songs so popular? Well, because we know what it's like to be hurt, right? We know what it's like to be rejected. We know what it's like to be made fun of. We know what it's like to be dumped. We know what it's like to be cheated on. We know what it's like to be abused and done wrong and hurt in some way and to want the person who did us wrong to get what's coming to them and to get even and for things to be made right. Like we, we want these kind of things. We long for these kinds of things. In fact, I don't know all of the pain in this room this morning, but I know that there are people here that if there's a name you were called all the way back in middle school, that if you heard it right now, it would make your stomach start to turn. There are people in the room right now who heard their mom and their dad come to them and say things like, you know, mom and dad, we're, we're going to separate for a little while. And you feel the pain all over again of a, of a dad who chose a secretary over your family. There's people in this room who know what it's like to hide when their dad has lost his temper, maybe in a drunken rage, and they're just hoping that he's not going to come in their room and take it out on them. 
There's all kinds of pain. There's people who've been cheated on and people who've been rejected and people who've been made fun of in this room. And so when we hear these songs, they give us a chance to live vicariously and to to think about even if we never got our payback, even if we never got even, we get to kind of therapeutically sing about and, and celebrate people who did get even. We love those stories. We have to admit that to ourselves. We, we see something just about it when, when it's, it's fair when somebody gets what's coming to them. But one of the key themes in the Count of Monte Cristo or in all these songs is the theme of the tables turning. So now the, the victim has the advantage over the person who hurt them. And so now they have the opportunity to, to exact their vengeance. Here's the question that Jesus wants us to ask this morning from Matthew chapter 5. How do we react? How do we act when the tables turn? When we're the one who has the advantage? When we have the opportunity and the means to get back at the people who hurt us? How do we act? Do we act just like everybody else? Do we act just like the people who hurt us when they had the means and the opportunity they hurt us? Or do we act differently? Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount is calling us not to life like everybody else. He's calling us to an exceptional life, a life that looks different than everybody else around us. So let's see what Jesus says to us about vengeance and getting back at those who have wronged us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, we'll read down through the end of the chapter. These are the words of Jesus himself. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. May God bless the reading of his word. Three things I want us to see here in Jesus' teaching this morning. Number one, the what. What is the command that he gives us? It's don't retaliate. Instead, do good to your enemies. Now, if you've missed some of the sermons in this sermon series or or you're just kind of, it's time to kind of catch up. What is the Sermon on the Mount all about? What's kind of going on? What has Jesus talked about before that's setting up what he says here? Let me kind of just explain to you briefly. The Sermon on the Mount, what's happening here in the Gospel of Matthew is that Matthew is showing us that Jesus is the greater Moses, that he's the prophet that Moses prophesied would come and and bring about and usher in a very brand new kingdom. And that's who Jesus is. I don't know if you ever thought about this before, the the parallels. You remember Moses' life? Moses, when he was a, a, a baby, had a tyrant, Pharaoh, that wanted to kill him. And so his parents had to hide him away to save his life. When he grew up and became a man, he passed through the waters of the Red Sea, wandered around in the wilderness, and then went up on Mount Sinai to get the law from God and then bring it down and teach it to the people. And if you think about the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is replaying the life of Moses. When he's a a boy, there's a tyrant, Herod, who wants to kill him, and his parents have to hide him so that he is safe. When he grows up to be a man, he passes through the waters in his baptism. And then immediately he goes out into the wilderness. And now after he goes out in the wilderness in chapter four, chapter five, he goes up on the mountain. And as the greater Moses, he's giving a new law to the new people of God. He's giving them new commandments. He's showing them what the Old Testament predicted. (laughs) In fact, what he does there starting in verse 21 through what we just read at the end of verse 48 is he's correcting six times. He corrects the people of that day's misunderstanding of the Old Testament. And he says, this is what you've heard. This is your opinion. This is your interpretation of the Old Testament, but it's wrong. Here's what the Old Testament predicted. Here's what the Old Testament pointed to. And what the Old Testament pointed to was true righteousness. This is the question that Jesus is asking of the people in his day and what he asks of us uh, today. 
The question that we have to be faced with, as he says earlier, if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The question that he wants us to face this morning is this. Would I rather be righteous or be thought righteous? Would I rather actually be righteous or just have people think that I'm righteous? See, that's what Jesus is after. Jesus is not after external righteousness where you follow a bunch of rules and everybody says, well, look how great John is. He follows all the rules. No, Jesus is after an internal righteousness that shows how gracious God is. And he fleshes out what that looks like in these passages where he corrects their misunderstanding of the Old Testament. He says, look, I've come to fulfill the the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill what the Old Testament predicted. What the Old Testament predicted was in the future, there's going to be a community, a people of God that have been transformed by the spirit of God. And so they reflect the love of God to the world. This is what he says. This is what the Old Testament has been promising in Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah, a new heart, new spirit, new life, born again, able to actually obey the commands of God. That's what they were looking forward to. And guess what? It's here because I'm here. And he's pointing out, this is what the Old Testament promised, this pattern. And you see it in the Old Testament itself. And then Jesus is fleshing it out here. Here's the pattern. God gives us a command, thou shalt not sin. Just fill in the blank, whatever that sin is. Thou shalt not sin. And then he goes a step further and deals with the heart cause of that sin. And then he goes a step further and calls us to practical righteousness. So it's not just avoid sin, but it's deal with the heart, the root cause of your sin, and then actually practice positive righteousness. So one example in the Old Testament, 10 commandments say thou shalt not steal, right? You're not to take property that doesn't belong to you. But then the 10th commandment goes a little bit further, right? It says thou shalt not covet. So it's not just don't take people's property, but don't want, desire what doesn't belong to you. Deal with the heart issue that causes the theft in the first place. And then if you read later in the law in Exodus and Deuteronomy, for example, you'll see that he goes to positive righteousness where he says, look, not only should you not steal and not only should you not covet, you actually have a responsibility to protect the property rights of your neighbor. So that if you see your neighbor's cow, that his livelihood is ox that helps him to make a living wandering down the road, it's gotten loose from his house, it's gotten loose from his barn, it's wandering down the road. You have a responsibility to go and grab that cow and take it back to your neighbor's house. So not just don't steal, but protect his property. And then that's exactly what Jesus is doing here in the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying, listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to abolish the law about murder. I'm trying to deal with the heart cause that causes murder in the first place, anger. So yeah, don't murder, but in my kingdom, in this transformed people that I'm creating, I'll, there won't even be any anger that causes murder in the first place. I'm going to deal with the hard cause. And then I'm going to go a step further to positive righteousness. Reconcile with the person that you're angry with. Make things right with them. He goes further. I'm not, I'm not abolishing the law about adultery. I'm worried about the lust in the heart that causes adultery in the first place. And I want to move from not committing adultery and not having lust in your heart to being pure and remaining committed to the spouse that you've committed your life to. He's over and over again saying, look, the old covenant, the, the, their misunderstanding, they thought it was all about this external rule keeping. But no, I'm after the heart and I'm after positive righteousness. And that's what I want in your life. And so now he comes to their misunderstanding of the law of retaliation. He says there in verse 38, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I said, you do not resist the one who is evil. Now, the law of retaliation was a law that was instituted as a, as a means for the courts in Israel to carry out justice. So this is a way for the courts. If somebody was injured, then the, the offending party would be injured in the exact same way. It was a way to uh, keep vendettas at bay. It was a, it was a way to, to try to stop vengeance. But what the people in Jesus' day were doing was they took that law that was about court justice and they turned it basically like Batman into personal, being a personal vigilante and saying, okay, now I'm going to exact my vengeance. You took out my eye, I'm going to take out your eye. You knocked out my tooth, I'm going to knock out your tooth. And so they turned this into personal vengeance. And Jesus says, listen, that's not 
the way to live. I know that deep down, it feels like that's the way to live, right? Like this is, this is early on, not one of us in this room who are parents have to teach our kids to retaliate, right? Not one of us has to pull our son aside and say, hey, listen, you know what? I saw that sissy took that toy you were playing with. You know what you should do next time she does that? Knock her down. Take that toy back. That's yours. Don't get mad. Get even, right? Not what, like I never, ever had that conversation with my son. But guess what I've seen my son do? Push his sisters to get what he thinks belongs to him. In fact, one time I saw uh, Judson, our youngest, uh, was flicked our oldest daughter, Maddie, twice. I said, why, why, did, he, why did he do that? And he, she, he said, because she flicked me once. And it's like, Jesus gets this, right? That this law of an eye for an eye, it doesn't even out the playing field. What it does is it, it leads to this endless one-upping. Okay, you flicked me one time, I'm going to flick you two. All right, I'm going to flick you three. And it's just endless one-upping until what happens? Everybody's toothless. Everybody's eyeless. It's violence begets violence. And Jesus is saying, that's not the way that you are to live. You're to, to let go of those things. And so in our own lives, how do we retaliate? Holding a grudge? Keeping score, right? You have your, your list of the people who've wronged you. Maybe, maybe in marriage, right? You have, keep your list of the ways that your husband has wronged you. Keep your list of the ways that you feel like your wife has wronged you. How do you react to that? How's your retaliation? Some people blow up in a temper, yell, argue, scream, fight. Others just stew in this cold silence, right? Well, if you don't know what you did, I'm not going to tell you. I don't know what I did. Well, I'm not going to tell you, right? Do you gossip about somebody at work or at school that you feel like has been harmful to you? One of my, one of my favorites is, is uh, road rage. I don't know if, you, if you, any of you guys have this, but it's like the, the person pulls in front of you and then slows down and you get mad. And so my dad, who's a, who's a preacher, he loves to flick the lights at him, you know, the flick the light guy. And then if you're really like high level at this, what you do is you pass them in the left lane, get in front of them and then slow down, right? And then you, just, you make them almost hit your bumper. Uh, that's like high level getting even with them for cutting you off in traffic. I, I don't know what your way is, the way you get angry, the way that you stew, the way that you hold a grudge, the way that you keep lists. But Jesus says that's not the way to live. All that does is keep the evil in circulation, keep the violence in circulation, and it doesn't heal the relationship. And so Jesus gives four examples here of in their lives, in, their, in that day and age, uh, of things that they would encounter that fleshes this out. And he says, here's how you're to respond if this happens, okay? And it boils down to basically two things, that kind of parallels. Don't insist on immediate justice for yourself. Or a corollary, don't insist on your personal rights. That's what he says. Don't insist on your personal rights. Now, again, I know as Americans, this goes completely contrary to the way that we think. But he says, don't insist on your personal rights. He walks through because he says, listen, if you're insisting on your personal rights, then as we've talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, that's, that's life in the valley that's all about me. That's not life on the mountain that's focused on we, that's focused on others. And if you hold that, you'll never, if you insist on your rights always and only, You'll never heal your marriage. You'll never make up with your kids that, that have strained the relationship. You'll never restore the friendship. If you insist on your rights and aren't willing to give away your rights, you'll never heal the relationship. So Jesus says, don't insist on your rights. He gives these four examples. The first one, turn the other cheek. Okay, we've heard this before. He, somebody slaps you, don't slap them back. Turn the other cheek, let them slap you. Again, this goes against everything that we think and that we feel. But if you want to know if, if somebody is able to do this, Jesus, on the last day, will return in glory and judge every single person who has ever rejected him. And when Jesus was slapped in the face, he turned the other cheek. The exact same word that's used here in Matthew chapter 5 is used in Matthew 26, talking about the Roman soldiers slapping Jesus in the face before they nail him to the cross. And so he says, don't pick a fight. Don't pick a fight. Don't get even. Just let it go. Second thing he says, somebody 
sues you for your tunic, then give them your cloak as well. Now, the tunic was the inner garment. The cloak was the outer garment. And in fact, the cloak was a right. It was a right of possession. There's places in the Old Testament that talk about if somebody sues you and takes your tunic or your cloak, they've got to give it back to you before sundown. And if they don't, God's going to get after them for what they've done because he's going to be compassionate to you. And Jesus says, hey, listen, even though that is a right for you under law, give it up. Paul later says in 1 Corinthians 6, when he's talking about Christians suing one another, he says, hey guys, listen, why not just be wronged? Why do you have to be proved right? Why do you have to go to the courts and and fight like this in front of unbelievers? Why not just be wrong? Jesus was wrong and he didn't fight back. Jesus had his clothes taken. He didn't do anything about it. Why not just be wronged and show grace to the other person? Verse 41, go the extra mile. Go the extra mile. What's happening here is because the Roman Empire had conquered Israel and had a, an occupying force in Palestine, there was a, a law in the Roman Empire that the Romans had these packs they had to carry with their weapons and their provisions, and they could compel under law, any Jew to carry their pack one mile. So they could grab anyone out of the crowd and say, you've got to carry this a mile. And they had to do it. They had to do it. And so this would have been an absolute humiliation, a constant reminder of the fact that we're servants to somebody else. But Jesus says, listen, instead of doing what most people do, instead of, it's kind of like when we get pulled over in traffic, right? We're never like, "Uh, thank you, sir. I know I was speeding. Please give me a ticket. What do we say? Don't you have anything better to do? Don't you know there's real crimes going on out there? Me being 10 miles over the speed limit is not that big a deal, right? And Jesus says, instead of most Jews who take that pack and for a mile mutter under their breath about the soldier and see between their teeth, he says, why don't you talk to them, be kind to them and say, you know what? Why don't I carry this twice as far as you wanted me to carry it? Which attitude brings more glory and more puts on display the grace of God? Doing what you are compelled to do, gritting your teeth, or graciously going further than you are required. And then verse 42, the last one, he says, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Give up. I know your money's yours. I know it's rightfully yours. Why not freely give it up? I mean, Jesus did. Paul tells in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, That Christ, he says, you know the grace of our Lord, that Jesus, though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. I know that belongs to you. Why not give it up freely and bless others the way that God has blessed you and be light and be salt and let people see that that the Jesus way of life is different. It's something that's compelling and something that they should want to know about. So he says, this is the way that you are to live. Now, let me just say a couple things of clarification real quick. I'm not, I'm not saying, and I don't think Jesus is saying that it's never right to defend your family. I don't think that Jesus is saying you got to give away every piece of clothing you have and walk around naked. I don't think Jesus is saying you got to give away every bit of money from everybody who ever asked of you so that you don't have any money yourself. Okay, I don't think that that's what he is saying. And, I'm not, and I don't think that what he's saying is you should never go to the authorities if you are being mistreated. Listen, if you are in the room today and you are a wife who's in an abusive relationship, do not turn the other cheek. Go to the police and let them deal with your, your, your husband. Or if you're a child being abused, go to the police. Go to somebody and tell them and get out of that situation. But here's the difference. Even when you get out of that situation, even when justice is done, can you move to forgiveness? Can you move to love? I'll just tell you this real quick. I know a, a, a young mom, when she was a little girl, her dad would abuse her over and over again, abuse her. And then years later, he was in a car accident that took away basically his ability to walk so that he couldn't abuse or do anything with anybody anymore. And yet that, that young mom has forgiven and loves her dad and has a relationship with him. Doesn't mean she lets the grandkids stay at grandpa's house. But she does display the grace of God to him by loving him, even though he's not worthy of her love. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is, 
Do we display the grace of God to the world by the way that we react to things? Or are we constantly, just like everybody else, insisting on my rights and what belongs to me? Jesus says there's a different way to live. And so the second thing we need to see here, the what is, don't retaliate, do good to your enemies. Then Jesus gives us the why. He's a good teacher, not just what to do, but why to do it. And the why is because it shows that you love like God your father. It shows that you love like God your father. Look what he says there in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Here's what's going on here. Here's the misunderstanding and the misinterpretation of the Old Testament that they have. That second clause, hate your enemy, you could go home today, read from Genesis to Malachi, every single verse. Guess what you're not going to find in the Old Testament? Any command to hate your enemy. It's not there. In fact, the Old Testament says the exact same thing as the New Testament. Love and do good to your enemy. So the Old Testament does not say hate your enemy. That's an addition that the people in Jesus' day were adding to the actual law. And they were subtracting something from the law as well. Guess what? If you know this, this, this law, some of you have been in church You know, when Jesus was asked, what are the two greatest laws? He said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said, what? Love your neighbor as what? Yourself. Yourself. Well, guess what? They weren't saying love your neighbor as yourself. They were saying love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So what are they doing? They took a law, love your neighbor as yourself, that was meant to show you how you're supposed to love people as yourself. And they turned it into a law about who I'm supposed to love, just my neighbor not my enemy, not the people who are not like me, not the people that have something wrong with me. I'm only supposed to love the people that I want to love who are my neighbor. And they're completely misrepresenting what the Old Testament says. And so Jesus says, he corrects it. He says, no, no, relate to everybody like they're your neighbor. Okay. Be Mr. Rogers. All right. Relate to everybody like they're your neighbor and love them. And again, we see the change, right? It's not just don't retaliate, and it's not just deal with the hard issue of bitterness and angriness, but positively move towards good. Love them, do acts of kindness for them, and pray for them. So let's take review of our lives right now. Right now, in your heart, in your mind, think through, who is somebody in your life that you do not like? Who is somebody in your life that you do not like, or that you have a grudge, that you have some kind of anger, tension, bitterness with. Somebody you would consider a rival or an enemy. It may not even be a rival or an enemy. It could be in marriage. It could be in friendships. It could be in school where you have contempt for somebody and, and things have gotten so bad where it's constant tension. Whoever that person is, let me ask you a question based on what Jesus just said. How often do you pray for that person? How often do you pray for that person? It's kind of hard to keep being angry at somebody that you're praying God's best for. And so move from bitterness to this positive doing good and praying for it. This is going to be key for us Christians as we increasingly move into a non-Christian nation as we try to share our faith with people. Because one thing people are going to have to absolutely know is those Christians love me even though they don't agree with me. And we've got to reclaim that in America. I don't know when we got to the point where if I don't agree with you, that means I have to hate you. It's toxic. And Jesus is calling us to a better way of life. And he says, the reason you do this is because it shows that you are a child of God. He says, it shows that you are a son of God. Not love your enemy So that you can become a child of God, love your enemy because it reveals that you already are a child of God. Okay, please, please hear me. You don't forgive your enemy, love your enemy, pray for your enemy to earn God's acceptance. You do it to show that you've already been accepted by God through faith in Jesus Christ. Your effort at loving your enemy is not what's going to get you into heaven. Jesus' death and resurrection is what's going to get you into heaven. But Jesus says something, and, and this is, you'll see this on the screen. We'll get to this in a couple weeks. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, Jesus says this, and I, I want you to let these words sit with you. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now listen, let me ask you a question. 
What happens if God doesn't forgive your sin? Answer, hell. Hell. And Jesus says, if you forgive others their sin, God will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their sin, God will not forgive you. What is he saying? John, is he saying that my entrance into heaven is contingent on how perfect a forgiver I am? No, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, if you are not a forgiving kind of person, not perfectly forgiving, but if you are not overall a forgiving kind of person, then you should question whether or not you believe the gospel in the first place. You say, how can you say that? I'll say it like this. I've said this to you before. When you hold a grudge against somebody, when you refuse forgiveness against somebody in your life, here's what you're saying by that grudge. You're saying, I believe that the cross of Jesus Christ is enough to forgive me for the sins I've committed against God, but it's not enough to forgive the sins that have been committed against me. Listen, that's not about effort. That's a failure to trust the power of the cross. It's a failure to believe the gospel. You're saying, yeah, sure, Jesus' death can take care of my sins, but man, you don't know what that person did to me. No, Jesus drowned in his own blood because of what that person did for you. And the cross is absolutely enough to take care of it. And so do you believe the gospel? One of the ways that you know you believe the gospel is, are you the kind of person who loves like your heavenly father loves? So he says, listen, everybody loves people who love them. That's nothing. Everybody loves people who love them. What's exceptional is loving the unlovely and loving the unlovable. And that's what God does. He he makes the sun rise on the evil and the just. He makes the rain fall on the evil and the righteous. As one man said, to return evil for good is satanic. To return good for good is human, but to return good for evil, that's divine. And that's what God is calling us to. So do we love just like everybody else, right? You do good to me, I'll do good to you. Or do we display the love of God and love the unlovely? Here's the deal. Jesus said earlier in the Sermon on the Mount that we're to be salt and light in the world and that we're to, to do, do good so that people will see our good deeds and glorify our Father who's in heaven. Question is, how do we do that? Because in, in our lives, when people do good to other people, guess who gets the glory usually? The person doing the good, right? People see Bill Gates, all this philanthropy that he does, they don't say, man, how great is God? They say, man, how great is Bill Gates? But if you forgive somebody who's wronged you, that's a game changer. When you have, this happened a couple years ago, I have a friend who pastors a church in Austin and he had a a missionary they sent out of his church to a Middle Eastern country who was gunned down by radicals in in that country. And the next day his wife went on Good Morning America and forgave the men who killed her husband. That's something completely different than just being a good philanthropist. That's giving glory to God in heaven. And so he says there in verse 46, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors act the, uh, act the same? So he's, he's calling us to look forward to the reward. He's calling us to look forward to the end and saying, okay, based on what God's going to do in the end, now you react a certain way here in the present. This is exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. You'll see this on the screen. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 12. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Behold, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. What is Paul saying? Listen, Paul writes this letter to men and women whose family members have been thrown to the lions in the Colosseum, whose husbands and wives have been dipped in wax and turned into human candles to light Nero's dinner parties. And Paul says to them, don't get vengeance. Trust that God will get vengeance in the end. Now, here's the objection. And I the whole time, I'm sure this objection has been building in your, in your heart, in your mind. John, you don't know what he did to me. You don't know what she did to me. You would not ask me to do this. It's not right. Justice should be done and justice hasn't been done. Guess what Paul's answer to your objection is? They will get what's coming to them. 
they will get it. You say, is that really a right way to look at things? Yeah, absolutely. Because here's the, here's the deal. The person who sinned against you, the person who hurt you, there's two possibilities for them. Number one, they're a Christian. If they're a Christian, then what they did to you was bought by the blood of Jesus, and you don't need to add to that payment one cent. And the second possibility is they're not a Christian, and they're going to pay for what they did to you and for what they've done to God forever in hell, and he doesn't need your help with that. Not one bit. You say, John, that seems like, like too much. That, that's, that doesn't seem right. Like It's not a right way to think, right, that they're going to get theirs in the end, and so that's the way that I, I use that knowledge that they're going to get what, what's coming to them to, to let things go here in the present. Yeah, that's absolutely what you're called to do. In fact, it's what Jesus did. Because 1 Peter 2 tells us when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He handed judgment over to God and said, you will do what is right. You will sort this out and I'm going to trust you to do it. In fact, Tim Keller uh, talks about this, that this, this idea that's, that's rampant in our culture, that, that people think if we believe, if we as Christians believe in a God who judges, if we believe in a God of divine wrath and, and, and judgment, that it will automatically turn us into judgmental and violent kind of people. That's what Keller says. Skeptics think if we believe in a God of divine vengeance, it's going to make us vengeful people. And Keller says the exact opposite of that is true. And he, he quotes a Croatian theologian who's been through war, a guy named Miroslav Volf, who says this, and let me just kind of wrap things up with this. Only those who believe in wrath can forgive, Volf says. He says, refusing to retaliate requires belief in divine vengeance. My idea may be unpopular in the West, but imagine talking to people whose houses and villages have been pillaged, whose daughters and wives have been raped, whose men and children have been slaughtered. The only way to prevent violence by us is to insist that violence is only legitimate when it comes from God. He says, if it takes, I love this line, the quiet of the suburbs to birth the idea that the only way humans will be nonviolent is if we believe in a God who refuses to judge. He says, look, it's only in the quiet confines of Cross Creek and West Hills and North Shore that you can come up with this idea that believing in a nonviolent God is going to make us nonviolent. He said, in a land soaked by innocent blood, that idea would perish. If God were not angry at injustice and didn't make a final end of violence, he would not be worthy of our praise. Keller says, skeptics think that belief in a God who judges will make us judgmental on violence, but the reverse is true. If you have been truly wronged, the only way to refuse payback is to have a strong conviction that God will eventually set that right. Number three, finally, how? How do, how do we pull this off? How do we pull off verse 48? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. I, I can't do that. I can't be perfect. And you can't be perfect. How do we do this? Jesus has done this for us and offers us new life. This is the life that Jesus lived. You think about the life that Jesus lived. When he was mocked, he said nothing in return. When he was slapped across the face, he turned the other cheek. When he had his garments, not just his cloak and his tunic, but his, his underwear taken from him, he did not respond in kind, even though he said, I could call an army of angels out of heaven and deal with this right now. And when he was made to carry on his back the most violent Roman equipment possible, the cross beam that would put him to death. He carried it outside the city. He went the extra mile. And when his hands and feet were being nailed to the cross, he looked down in the eyes of his murderers and he said, Father, forgive them. He prayed for his persecutors. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus lived the Sermon on the Mount. And you ask me, listen, John, you're telling me that if I if I reject the values of this world where, where it's about power, it's about getting even, it's about insisting on my rights, if I give all that up, is it going to work? Well, let's just think about this fact. Right now, th those Roman soldiers who were part of the greatest empire at that time the world has ever seen, 
you can today pay about 20 bucks and get a ticket and walk over the ruins of that empire. But you can look around in this room and see the kingdom of Christ is alive and well. And it's free to all who would come. And so do you want to know if this works? If, if flipping the script and saying, you know what, I don't need to be powerful. I can be meek. And I don't need to get even. I can give up my rights. And I don't need to, to, to pour out my vengeance. I'm going to trust that God's got all this and he's going to set things right. Three days later, after Jesus went through all this, he walked out of the grave. And he offers that resurrection life to anyone who will believe in him. And he says, listen, no, you can't do this. But I can. And I can change your life so this becomes the kind of person that you are. Listen, the one thing I don't want you to do, all these sermons that you hear from the Sermon on the Mount, one thing I don't want you to do is I don't want you to come away from these commands that Jesus is giving us and look at this as an imposing laundry list of do's and don'ts that just weigh you down where you say, there's just no way I could ever be that kind of person. Because what Matthew's gospel is about first and foremost is not that Jesus is our teacher, it's that Jesus is our savior. And he's our changer and he's our transformer. And he's going to make us into the kind of person that's person of the kingdom. It's a citizen of the kingdom. And so if you want to live an exceptional life, if you want to live a life that's different from everybody around you, go to Jesus because this is the life that he lived. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to take time to pray. And I just want to challenge you with this. Where, whoever is in the room right now, I don't know where you stand with the Lord, but, but here's what I want you to think about. Most people in this room think, or many people in this room think there's, there's two ways to live. There's, there's, I can live life my way, and it's the irreligious way, and, and it can, it's the way that ignores God. Or there's the religious way. It's God's way. It's, it's, it's following the rules. It's performing so that God will love me, and God will accept me, and God will take me to heaven when I die. But Jesus is showing us there's actually a third way to live. It's not, I'm going to do things my way, and it's not, I'm going to try to follow the rules so that God will love me. It's, it's not, I obey so that God will accept me. It's, God accepts me graciously, freely in Christ, by faith in Christ. Therefore, I get to obey and I get to try to live out this new life that he's laid out for me. And so wherever you are in this room, if that's not the way you're living right now, if you're living your way, lay that down. If you're trying to live this religious way where it's about keeping the rules so that God will love you, that's a burden you should put down and just go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to completely change and transform my life. Father, I pray right now for everybody in the room. If there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus, I pray, Lord, they go to the care and prayer room today and talk to somebody about how they can live a new life. They can be given a new life, a fresh start today. Father, anybody here who, who says, I'm a Christian, but, but John, I'm not a very forgiving person, and I'm, I'm, it's not easy for me to give away my rights, and it's, it's difficult for me not to get even then just confess that to the Lord and ask his forgiveness and ask him by the power of his spirit to slowly and gradually begin to transform you. Help him, ask him to help you see the beauty of what Christ is, this life that Christ has lived for us and to become more like Jesus because that's what the spirit is about anyways. So Father, we pray that you would make us, the people called Foothills Church, a people who display your patient love to the world, even loving those who are unlovable. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.